I'm Tawny Plattis, and you're listening to Dirty Bits, the podcast that explores the dirty bits of history your teacher probably left out. Maria Sklodowska, more commonly known by her French name as Marie Curie, is mostly known for her groundbreaking work in radioactivity and being a fierce bitch on wheels. She was a pioneering chemist and physicist, the first woman to ever win a Nobel Prize, the first person to ever be awarded two Nobel Prizes, the only woman to ever win twice, and the only person to win a Nobel Prize in two different sciences. She was the first woman to become a professor at the University of Paris, and in 1995, became the first woman to ever be entombed on her own merits in the Pantheon in Paris. She discovered two chemical elements, essentially invented the concept of radioactivity, and founded a scientific dynasty. Her daughter Irene and son-in-law Frederick shared a Nobel Prize in the 30s, Irene being the second woman to win the Nobel Prize. Marie Curie also found herself embroiled in a highly publicized scandal involving a married man she lived with and was the subject of not one, but two duels. The scientist formerly known as Maria Sklodowska was born in Warsaw in the Russian part of Poland on November 7, 1867. In what's clear evidence that being an overachiever is genetic, her parents were both well-known teachers. Her mother operated a prestigious Warsaw boarding school for girls and resigned when Marie was born. Her grandfather was a physics and chemistry teacher, and her father taught physics and math. Today, Irene's children are both esteemed scientists, one a nuclear physicist and the other a biologist. There are five Nobel Peace Prizes in this family, if you weren't already feeling inadequate today. But the problem was that her family was composed of a bunch of hardcore patriotic nationalists who supported an independent Poland. The Russians ended up scooping up all their shit, so they were poor, causing Marie and her four siblings to struggle all their lives. Her father was also the director of two schools for boys. After Russian authorities cut laboratory instruction from the Polish schools, he smuggled a bunch of laboratory equipment home like a nerdy kingpin and instructed his children in its use. Her father was eventually fired by his Russian supervisors for being way too Polish, and he was forced to take lower-paying entry-level jobs. And then the family also lost money on a bad investment and eventually had a bunch of students living in the house to supplement their income. It was one of these boarders who gave her oldest sister typhus, and she died when Marie was only about eight. Then, not even three years later, her mom dies of tuberculosis. So even though she's devastated, Marie buckles down and gets to work, because radium isn't going to discover itself. She begins attending a boarding school, and then attends a high school for girls. She graduates with a gold medal at the age of 15, and was first in her class. And she's like, damn, I'm actually really good at this. I think I could make a difference. Science is beautiful, and I'm pretty positive I'm the brilliant mind that's going to rock their little worlds when I roll up to the university. But nobody wants to take her because she's a woman. But she's like, oh, fuck that. And she and her sister, Bronislawa, enroll in the Flying University, which was not founded by Monty Python, but was a Polish patriotic institution of higher learning that admitted women students and was an illegal underground night school run by a handful of young Polish kids. The school was super hipster, and classes met in changing locations to avoid discovery by any Russian authorities trying to crash the party. So they study at the university for a while, and once they have the funds, she and her sister head to France, intending to study at the Sorbonne. This is also when she changes her name from Maria to its French version, Marie. So Marie goes up to her sister one day and is like, hey, why don't we do a tradesies here? I'll work for two years and support us while you study, and then you work two years and I'll go to school. And she's like, yeah, totally, for sure, I'm super down. Then her sister actually ends up getting married to this guy, Dr. Dlusky, and they all decide to live together. Marie's brother-in-law noted her independent spirit in a letter to her father that said, Miss Marie works very diligently. She spends nearly all day at the Sorbonne. We usually only see her in the evening. She is a very independent person. Therefore, though you named me her official guardian, 
She not only shows me little respect, but also refuses to listen. She cares about my authority as much as she would care about a torn shoe. So Marie is filling her end of the bargain she has with her sister, and she's working as a governess for a family, and they're actually her father's relatives. She ends up falling in love with their son, Kazimierz Zorowski, a future mathematician. But his parents don't want him marrying their broke-ass cousin, and he was unable to defy their snobby wishes. Marie's loss of the relationship with him was incredibly painful for both of them. He later earned a doctorate, and became a professor at Krakow University. And even as an old man and professor at the Warsaw Polytechnic, he would sit contemplatively and tragically before the statue of Marie that had been erected there in 1935. So anyway, Marie finishes school and begins her scientific career in Paris, working with magnetic properties of various steels. And this physicist approaches her and he's like, hey, I heard you were looking for a bigger lab. And my boy Pierre, who's a teacher at the physics and chemistry school, has access to one if you want to check it out. And she's like, oh yeah, cool, I'll talk to him. So they meet up and Pierre takes one look at her and goes, oh, big lab? Yeah, for sure, I have, I have a huge lab. But he doesn't have a big lab. He's just totally in love with her and he makes a place for her to work next to him. They bond over their mutual obsession of natural science and eventually Pierre proposes. But Marie's like, eh. I kind of want to go back to Poland. And Pierre is a little taken aback and goes, fine, I'll go with you, even if I have to teach French, which would totally suck. So she ends up going back to visit, and he convinces her to return to Paris, and they get married in 1985. Marie wore a dark blue outfit, as opposed to a traditional bridal gown, and wore it from there on out as a laboratory outfit, because why the hell not? They were super in love. They took long bicycle trips and frequently traveled abroad. According to Marie, our work drew us closer and closer until we were both convinced that neither of us could find a better life companion. And in a love letter to Marie, Pierre wrote, It would nevertheless be a beautiful thing in which I hardly dare believe to pass through life together, hypnotized in our dreams, your dream for your country, our dream for humanity, our dream for science. They had two children together. Eve, who later repped the arts as opposed to science, became a journalist and a pianist. And they also had Irene, the Nobel Prize award-winning scientist. And even though she's a French citizen, Marie used both her surnames, Sklodowska and Curie. And she had some serious Polish pride. She taught her daughters Polish, took them on visits to Poland, and even named the first chemical element that she discovered, polonium, after her native country. But the happy times were not to last. In 1906, Pierre was killed instantly in a tragic street accident when he was run over by a horse-drawn carriage that was supposedly carrying six tons of military uniforms. Marie said about her husband's death, crushed by the blow, I did not feel able to face the future. I could not forget, however, what my husband used sometimes to say, that even deprived of him, I ought to continue my work. Despite losing the love of her life, Marie continued with her work, taking Pierre's place in the physics department and becoming the first female professor at the Sorbonne. Then in 1910, when she's 43, about four years after her husband died, she starts this highly publicized love affair with Paul Langvin, a scientist who was described as being a pretty decent looking guy with a thriving mustache. He was also her husband's former student. But there was a dirty bit of a problem. Langvin was married with four kids already in what was said to be an unhappy union. His wife reportedly once hit him over the head with a bottle, possibly due to his many, many affairs. So they rent an apartment near the Sorbonne, where they can shack up, but Langvin's wife discovered what they were doing, as well as the love letters that Marie had written to him. And she has the letters published in the papers. And the letters reveal that it was clearly not just a physical infatuation, because Marie was thinking in terms of marriage, and had written to her lover, urging him to divorce his wife and marry her. As you can imagine, the publication of the letters scandalized France. 
At one point, Marie was coming home from a conference in Belgium, and there's an angry mob outside her house, and they're messing with her two daughters. So she picks up the kids, she hulks it through the crowd, and makes it to her friend's house. It didn't help that the media was printing bullshit rumors about her in an attempt to sensationalize the event, proving not much has changed in over 100 years. They claimed that the affair had started when Pierre was still alive, calling Marie a homewrecker and a seductive Jew, playing into the rampant xenophobia at the time. And she's like, I'm not even Jewish, I'm just Eastern European. Not that there's anything wrong with being Jewish, but damn, these are just bold-faced lies. And one of the journalists who wrote about the expose, Gustav Terry, calls Paul, the guy Marie was sleeping with, a boar and a coward. So Paul feels honor-bound to fight a duel against the journalist, and he demands the duel be fought with pistols. He makes all these elaborate preparations, but it's a complete shit show. The journalist just straight up refuses to shoot on the grounds that he doesn't want to rid France of one of its greatest minds. And Paul declares that he's not an assassin, and he puts the gun down too, and everybody goes home. Then there was another, more eventful duel, fought between two editors of rival papers over the merit of Paul's wife's charges. They skipped the guns, went straight to swords, and after what was described as several fierce bouts, one was injured, they reconciled, and again, everybody went home. And while these allegations were untrue, they tarnished Marie's name and the timing was terrible. She had just won a Nobel Prize, and the committee suggested she skip the awards ceremony. They asked her to stay in France rather than travel to Sweden to accept her award because they didn't want their king shaking hands with an adulteress. Which was interesting, because the king of Sweden was also accused of having an affair with a married man, later in his reign as well. The story goes that a man named Kurt went to the king in 1932 to ask for a liquor license for his restaurant, because he wasn't able to just go get one due to having a past criminal record. During the meeting, King Gustav allegedly seduced him. Kurt's wife files for divorce, the reason being her husband's relationship with the king, and Kurt is given about the equivalency of $170,000 to keep it on the DL. There ended up being one man who was a close friend of Marie Curie's who actually came to her defense. Sort of. Marie Curie and Albert Einstein met in 1909 and were colleagues and friends for almost 25 years. They attended scientific conferences and family vacations together. He chimed in on the whole scandal, saying, Marie has a sparkling intelligence, but despite her passionate nature, she is not attractive enough to represent a threat to anyone. But then he also encourages her and said she ought to come to Sweden regardless of the allegations. I am convinced that you should continue to hold this riffraff in contempt. If the rabble continues to be occupied with you, simply stop reading that drivel. Leave it to the vipers it was fabricated for. And finally, when a member of the Swedish Academy of Sciences writes to her, she responds, The prize has been awarded for the discovery of radium and polonium. I believe that there is no connection between my scientific work and the facts of private life. I cannot accept that the appreciation of the value of scientific work should be influenced by libel and slander concerning private life. Then she proceeded to walk across that stage, receive her award, and bitch slap the whole ordeal into next Tuesday. The publicity ended the relationship between Curie and Paul. It turns out he had not totally thrown in the towel on his marriage. His wife had just given birth to their fourth child right before he embarked on his affair with Marie. Paul and his wife ended up settling outside of court, and even ended up reconciling. And then he went on to father an illegitimate child with his secretary. But while the relationship between Marie and Paul ended, two generations later, and I'm not making this up, his grandson and her granddaughter get married. Marie's reputation didn't fully recover until when in 1914, she put together a fleet of vehicles carrying portable X-ray machines that helped doctors image broken bones shrapnel, and bullets in patients on the front lines. She adorably called her creations Petites Curies because she was also brilliant at marketing. 
Then in 1921, Marie Curie took her first trip to the United States, starting in New York City, making her way to Chicago, and then into Washington, D.C., in order to raise funds for research on radium. And it's in D.C. where President Harding, who also slept with married people, presents Marie with a gram of radium worth more than $100,000, which was paid for by donations made by American women, because that's how you support your sisters in STEM. The president then told her, We greet you as foremost among scientists in the age of science, as leader among women in the generation which sees women come tardily into her own. Marie Curie died in 1934 at the age of 66 in France due to aplastic anemia brought on by exposure to radiation while carrying test tubes of radium in her pockets during research and in the course of her work at field hospitals during World War I. Even now, because of their levels of radioactive contamination, her papers containing her work from the 1890s are too dangerous to handle. They are kept in lead-lined boxes, and in order to consult with them today, scientists must wear protective clothing. Even her cookbook is highly radioactive. Marie Curie once said, In science, we must be interested in things, not in persons. Be less curious about people and more curious about ideas. So she probably wouldn't have been too fond about my harping on her personal life. But it's through her personal life that we see what made her a successful scientist. She was passionate and caring, yet practical and dedicated to the truth above all. She hauntingly and relevantly once said, there are sadistic scientists who hurry to hunt down errors instead of establishing the truth. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. You cannot hope to build a better world without improving the individuals. To that end, each of us must work for his own improvement and at the same time, share a general responsibility for all humanity. Our particular duty being to aid those to whom we think we can be most useful. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or corrections for me, let me know in the comments section. Have a dirty day.